Today's gospel story, Mary's visit to Elizabeth, is an exclamation of surprise, which we shall repeat at the end of this service in the singing of the Angelus. It's the first time a human voice, that of Elizabeth, speaking to Mary as one surprised expectant mother to another, confirms what the angel had promised. Following Isaiah and Micah, whom we heard this morning, the barren one will give birth. And the themes of that little passage are haste, incredulity, the coming of the Holy Spirit, joy and surprise, as the angel had said to Mary, with God, nothing is impossible. Which brings me, briefly and with studied indifference, to myself. <laughs> I was ordained priest on the fourth Sunday of Advent, 1981, in the church of St. Mary in the Boltons by Bishop Mark Santa, then Bishop of Kensington, later Bishop of Birmingham. I don't recall the Holy Spirit asking me on that day. God, who knows you and me better than we know ourselves, would have known that my response would have been, can't you think of someone else? But anyway, it happened. And on that day, the bishop preached a devastating sermon. He said that all Christians take Christ's peace to others. All are to be ministers of reconciliation. But the bishop went further, directly at me, I suppose, because I was the only one being ordained that day. He said there is a particular ministry of peace and reconciliation for those called to be the successors of the apostles. It is a ministry which carries authority, but that authority is the strange authority of the cross. There is none other. Christ sends his servants out on precisely the same errand he was sent on which cost him everything. And the ending is to be the same, nailed to the cross with him. We are wounded people bearing the marks of the Lord Jesus. Wounded people, the bishop said. My last 40 years have not been consistently fruitful peaceful, forgiving, or even simply obedient. Never has the hound of heaven had to run so great a distance and for so long. I fled him down the arches of the years. I had to learn, as we all must, that I could not run my life on the basis of my own willpower alone. And I had to learn that prevarication and self-deceit are no match for the living God. And that the grace of God, which is deep and eternal love and forgiveness, still gets to us even when we do all we can to render ourselves unreachable. Maybe we are all a mixture of that strength and weakness, faithful to God up to a point. And faithfulness is a Christian virtue, faithfulness rather than success. But in the end game, when all has been said and prayed and done, what matters 
is God's faithfulness to us, the love that will not let me go. When Christ says to his disciples, receive the Holy Spirit, that means he's going to stay with them. It is in God's presence, which the heart can feel, though our reason stumbles, with God so forgiving and understanding that human hope prevails. We find we are not alone and never have been. The divine meets the human in all that the faith tradition provides for us, in art, poetry, theology, liturgy and prayer, and the sacraments, all the means of grace which this church reveals to each generation that comes through the door. Gratitude and hope, restoration and renewal, these are constant themes here. George Herbert, in the 17th century, in his poem, The Flower, describes a flower which has to go underground during the winter. And Herbert takes us into his winter and the coming spring and tells us what we never dared hope, that God has a garden where we grow again. Who would have thought my shriveled heart could have recovered greenness? Who would have thought? Back to Elizabeth in today's gospel, the incredulity of it. Why is this granted me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? And here is John Donne in one of his Christmas sermons from the 1620s, offering hope in COVID times. He can bring thy summer out of winter, though thou have no spring, though in the ways of fortune or understanding or conscience thou have been benighted till now, wintered and frozen, clouded and eclipsed, damped and benumbed, smothered and stupefied till now, now God comes to thee, not as in the dawning of the day, not as in the bud of the spring, but as the sun at noon to illustrate all shadow. Christmas, although we treat the story historically because that is the way we come to some understanding, is eternal. God comes and has always come to share his life with us. The Christmas story is about God getting through to us as we are, whatever our plight and priorities might be in the world as it is. The God of all creation knew your name before you were born and still today calls you from the heart of eternity. Yes, eternity, eternal life, that's the level we're on. In this temporal life, we take a name at baptism putting on the identity of Christ who takes us with him into his eternal life. Which brings me, as it happens, to another anniversary. I was baptized 70 years ago. I was baptized by my grandfather, just around the corner here, at All Souls Langham Place. <laughs> Baptism so rarely gets a laugh here. <laughs> Who would have thought it? As the moonwalker said, one small step, yet also a giant leap. 
<laughs> I've never celebrated any anniversary before now because our ministry is not just ours. It's the work of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit counts neither the years nor reckons the score. All in the end is God's harvest. But 40 years on seems as good a time as any to say thank you. Thank you to all of you and all those who over the last 40 years have supported, encouraged, and trusted me, probably more than you know. And thank you to All Saints Margaret Street, who allow me to sit tight in what must be the best post in the Church of England. But the real reason I've hijacked this sermon to talk about myself which we were always taught not to do, is just to add my voice and experience of God to yours and ours to that of the worldwide church to give thanks for the divine life we are given to share so that masked without but unmasked within, we can truly wish each other a happy Christmas. Amen. Amen.